where we left off. So let's go ahead and solve for y. So I'm subtracting 4x and then dividing by 3. And remember, when you divide by 3, you're dividing the entire right side by 3, not just the 4x part. But you're dividing both of those terms by 3. If you really want to write out the full notation, it would look something like that, times a third times a third on both sides. Of course, we know multiply by a third, you better do it on both sides. So you can really just write it like that. So I'm multiplying the whole entire equation by a third. All right, what is our slope? Negative four thirds. And I want a line, so parallel to this line, so we got our slope and I want to pass through one one. So I can line up either mx plus b, uh, slope intercept, I'm going to go with point slope form. So this is point slope form because I got a point right there. I don't have a y-intercept right away, so I'm going to use this form. So we got negative 4 thirds x minus, so here's x1, y1 are both 1. So x minus x1 plus y1. You do not need to do any more work than this. This is the equation of a line. So this is the answer to this example. If I ask you for the y-intercept, you may want to get turn into the you know form with the y-intercept, depending on what I'm asking you. But this is an equation represents that line. So ready for our last line example? Find line perpendicular to, I'll go with the same exact uh, line as before. 4x plus 3y equals 12. Passing through, 0, negative 5. So we saw before that perpendicular slopes are negative reciprocals of each other. So I got my first slope is right there. So my uh, slope of my original line, so I'm not going to go through those steps above, but it's negative 4 thirds. Now we're going to have another slope. So I think it makes some sense. I'll write maybe m0 for the original slope instead of just writing m. So there's our original slope, m0. So our new slope, or our perpendicular slope, you could call it m perp for perpendicular. It's going to be negative 1 over m0. And first thing you notice, we have multi-story fraction. So multi-story fractions are always dangerous. There's also two negative signs in this fraction. So what we're going to do is make sure we know how this fraction is grouped. There was really one piece in the numerator that was one. But in the denominator, there was an entire fraction down there. So I'm going to multiply by the reciprocal of the denominator. So instead of dividing by negative 4 thirds, that's the same as multiplying by 3 fourths. The reciprocal, two negatives cancel and give me a positive 3 fourths. So are there any algebra questions on that, uh, dealing with that multi-story fraction there? Whenever you got a multi-story fraction, the first thing you should do is uh, figure out what is the denominator. In this case, I grouped it by using parentheses and multiply by the reciprocal of that. So our new line 
y equals m x minus x1. Now I could use this, I got a point, no problem. This point is one very special kind of point. What axis is this going to, uh, this point going to be on? Y. The y axis. So what I really have is information about the y intercept right here. So what I'm going to use instead is the uh, uh, slope y intercept form. So totally okay to use this form, but I see that I have a y intercept, which is going to be my b value. So let's switch the form. So we have 3 fourths x minus 5. So I just went with slope intercept because I had my y intercept. Now make sure you have the y intercept, not the x intercept. That slope intercept form, it's the y intercept. It's not the x intercept in slope intercept form. So it's really 0b is the y intercept. So I use the form corresponding to that. So that is pretty much all we're going to talk about lines. I'll talk about them very, very briefly when we get to functions in chapter 2. But uh, there's nothing new about lines that you're going to be learning, just the notation is going to change a little bit. So this is pretty much the end I'll talk about, of talking about lines. And what we're going to move into next is circles. So it's pretty easy to draw a circle. I'm going to cheat and let this give me a perfect circle. Although if you draw a perfect circle, everything else you draw is going to look sloppy, just so you know. <laughs> I can't even draw a straight line segment as good as it gets. All right, so this circle, it has a couple properties. There's obviously a radius. What is the other defining property of a circle? Diameter. So diameter, but we could get that right off the radius. Circumference. We could get circumference, but I could get that right off the radius. <laughs> the center point. The center point. It's the only thing I can't really derive directly from the radius. We can get the area too. All you need is the radius. But we do need a uh, center, and I'm going to use a letter, the letters HK for the center. So H. H is the x-coordinate of the center, and K is the y-coordinate. And your radius better be greater than or equal to zero. It's a boring circle if your radius is zero, just a point. But your radius generally is going to be bigger than zero, or else you're not really talking about a circle. So these are two properties of a circle. Now, how would I know if a point was on the circle? So, for example, that blue point and that blue point not on the circle, but the green point is on the circle. So let's think about some ways we can describe points on the circle versus points not on the circle. So distance. If we think about distance and the center point, how can we define a circle using just the ideas of you know where the center is and you know about distance? How would I know that this point x, y is on the circle or if x, y is not on the circle if I didn't have a graph to look at? So a circle is a set of all points equidistant from the center point. So 
So I'll use d equals square root. So there's our distance formula that we saw before. <coughs> so set all points equidistant from the center point. I'm going to use letter R instead of D. And we generally don't like square roots when we can avoid them. So let's square both sides and get that square root out of there. So this is the same as R squared equals X minus H squared plus y minus k squared. So this is the, oh nice, standard form of the equation of a circle. So definition of a circle, all points that are some fixed distance from the center. So our first example, write the equation. Of a circle with radius five and center negative three comma six. So you got the form right above. All you have to do, figure out what's H, what's K, and you got the radius right there. So just take about 30 seconds, fill in these values right to that equation in the rectangle. So whenever you're writing a circle in standard form, or looking at a circle that's already in standard form, just remember the x, y coordinates of the center, if I'm just looking at the equation, the x coordinate's not three. The y coordinate's not negative six. So you can either remember it to be the opposite sign of what it looks like, or the other way that I recommend you think about it, what makes this first term zero? x plus three, what makes that zero? Negative three. What makes the second one zero? Positive six. So that's another way to think about it. What would make that term zero? What would make that term zero? So that's your center. So our next example, we're going to graph. So we, our circle is going to be x plus 2 squared plus y plus 3 squared equals 16. So we're going to need two things to graph. I need a center and I need a radius. So the radius, one hint I'll give you, it is not 16. Your radius is not 16. So I want you to write down the center, write down the radius and then go ahead and graph this with that information. And your radius is not 16. It's related to 16.
So you should get your center is 2, negative 3, and your radius is square root 16, which is 4. So you're really looking at the radius squared, not the radius. When I draw my circle, I like to use the center point. I like to make a tiny empty dot, because I don't want to think about the dot being an actual point on the circle. So that's just the center. And then measuring out 4 in each direction. So I draw a circle right down the center first, and then I carefully measure a radius to the right, to the left, up, and down. And then I just do my best, connect them, uh, make it as round as you can. So any questions on the graph? So other common things I could ask you, intercepts. How many x-intercepts should we expect? Should expect two x-intercepts? It's a little tricky, this x-intercept here, the one that's on the left, it looks like the x-coordinate should be negative, but it's possible my graph is off a little bit. Maybe the circle bends down a little bit more like that. It's a little hard to tell. Uh, if I want to find exactly where it was, I would use algebra and set my y-coordinate to be 0, and then figure out what are the two x values that I would get. Same thing, if I want a y-intercept, it's definitely going to be 2. It looks like 1 is probably above the x-axis with a positive y value, but again, if my circle is drawn a little poorly, maybe that's not quite correct, but definitely two y-intercepts for sure. <clears throat> so that was uh, standard form, and now I'm going to write down a general form of a circle. And this is very different from standard form. And the way we're going to, so <clears throat> if this is the general form, how could I take my original uh, circle from the last problem right there? How would I turn that into standard form? So we're going to convert this last example, x minus 2 squared plus y plus 3 squared equals 16, convert to standard form. What are some ideas of how to get this into, into general? So you could use one of your favorite F words from math class, FOIL, or also known as just square things correctly. So we're going to square out these two terms that are squared. And then I'll be able to write at the x squared term, and then separately, however many x's I get, separately, and then the y, do the same thing with the y. So go ahead and FOIL this out, both the x and the y term, and combine like terms, and get it into general form. So do that right now. All you got to do is FOIL a couple times and a tiny bit of algebra.
So are there any questions on this uh, general form algebra that I did here? I did the little shortcut formula for squaring, where a minus b squared is square the first term, square the second term, and then you're going to get a minus ab minus ba. So that's your minus 2ab. So don't forget about the middle term, or I should say the inside-outside term is the one people usually forget. So don't forget the inside-outside part. Now, <clears throat> so that should seem familiar. Really didn't do anything difficult there. What we're going to do next is see if I gave you this form right here, if I gave you general form, how are you going to take that and go back to standard form? So if I gave you the expanded version, and if I look at the expanded version, Right here, I don't see anything related to 16 for the radius right there, or 4. So you can't see the radius right away. So we're going to have to do some pretty serious algebra. What algebra uh, move am I going to make to convert back to standard? You're just going to factor everything, aren't you? I'm going to factor very carefully. I'm not going to factor an x out of these two terms. That would be an option, but that's not the one I'm going to take. So we're going to do what's called complete the square. So hopefully you remember completing the square. If not, I will show you completing the square right now. So you probably learned this in a slightly different way, and that's OK. You can use that way, but I'm, not, I'm going to teach it in uh, maybe a slightly different way than you may have learned it. So you can complete the square anytime you have a squared term plus a linear term, or an x squared term plus an x to the first power term. Your natural reaction might be to factor like this. And depending on what you're doing, that might be a reasonable thing to do. But that is not completing the square. So we're going to factor in a different way. So this is how we're going to complete the square. So now you should be thinking, well, why in the world does this actually work? So you shouldn't just believe everything I say. Most of it's true. Uh, but what we're going to do is actually check out, hey, is this right side really the same as the left side? How can I check if the right side is the same as the left side? You can use your favorite F word. FOIL. So FOIL out that term. You, B over 2 squared is pretty easy. It's B squared over 4. But FOIL out that first term right there. And then subtract B over 2 squared. So do that right now. So are there any algebra questions on this complete the square equality? So you could think of it as sort of reverse foiling, in a sense. You're picking a very, very specific uh, way to factor. You're just going to take half of the b, whatever coefficients in front of x, and write up in this form. All right, so now you should be convinced this complete the square, this is true right here. So we're going to use this now. So our last example, convert to standard form and graph.
So before I do any of the complete the square, I'm going to rearrange the terms. So my x's are next to each other and the y's are next to each other. So I have x squared plus 4x plus y squared minus 6y plus 12 equals 0. So there's two separate places I'm going to complete the square. There's an x complete the square and a y complete the square. And so we're basically completing the square in two different locations. Question? Oh, I'm just making a new example here. Yeah. You could go back and, and complete the square here, but if you complete the square, you're going to end up with uh, standard form right there. So you absolutely could do this technique starting here, but you're going to end right there. So it's good practice to do. Um, but we're going to do a different example. It should work. Any, anytime you have general form, you can go back to standard form. All right, so I will do the x uh, complete the square. So here b equals 4. So b over 2 is 4 halves, which is 2. And if I did this for y, our b value for y is negative 6. And b over 2, negative 6 halves, which is negative 3. So you want to be careful when your coefficient is negative. You're just dividing that negative coefficient by 2. So it's going to stay negative. So fill in the blanks for y. I completed the square on x, but fill in the blanks for completing the square on y. So are there any questions on the algebra of completing the square here? Where did you get the negative 4 in the second equation? Negative 4, that's from the, so that negative 4 comes from that minus 2 squared? Oh. Right there. So I basically just squared those two terms, that's a negative 4 and the other one's a negative 9. And then I add with a 12. So this complete the square can be a little tricky. Uh, alternative version. So if I do uh, the alternative version on just that y squared minus 6y, so forget all the other stuff, if I just look at that y squared minus 6y, you may have seen it done like this. 
Let's see, I'll need a minus or a plus three squared minus three squared. So you basically add and subtract what you're going to need. And then you go y minus three squared minus three squared. So that's another way you may have seen it done. Or instead of, so the problem, the way you were taught, you probably added three squared to both sides, yes. but that only works uh, if you have an equation. If you have an expression, there's no other side to add to. So the way you can get around that is you just add three squared to only one side, and then you subtract three squared to the same side, so you don't change anything. So this is another way to complete the square. That might be more similar to what you learned. If you really want to add three squared to both sides, you can do that too. There's no, um, nothing wrong with doing that. So this is the end of uh, 1.2. And next up is functions and function notations. So this is a good place to end.